there welcome to another fine episode of here's why you're wrong uh, I am Mick this is Jim Howdy. I like to start off by reminding everybody that the camera adds 50 pounds and that Jim and I are remarkably attractive in real life uh, you just can't tell at the moment um, hopefully we've got some folks listening out there in um, internet land um, to our new show today we're gonna be talking about politics which is I think a subject that sort of got Jim and I started in thinking about this show, right, Jim? Right, Mick. I mean, that's sort of, uh, you know, when we first met, we used to talk about politics, and uh, we're both uh, probably fairly left-leaning, um, although I think uh, we probably have some differences along the way, but um, I thought it would be nice to, uh, you know, sort of devote the show to politics. So we're going to talk about politics tonight. It's uh, going to be a one-hour show. Um, focused exclusively on politics and uh, for those of you that have listened uh, our last show was um, about a month ago and um, what the way that it works is we um, get sort of a, a certain amount of times we can be in here a month uh, that we try to come in here and do a show and the um, the the next show isn't necessarily scheduled at that same time so uh, we're going to get a few shows under our belt here, and then um, hopefully that will qualify us for a live show uh, that will have a recurring time slot and would be much easier to manage. So, And who do we have helping us in the booth? We've got Mike in the booth. Thank you, Jim. Hola, chicos. There's, there's <laughs> Mike. Um, so Mike's helping us in the booth. Uh, we're going to get a couple of these pre-recorded shows under our belt, uh, hopefully have some good discussion, and then uh, we can open it up to a recurring live slot out there um, but if you are listening online right now and you're listening to us live uh, you can give us a call at 503-207-7135 if you want to join the discussion about politics and we're gonna hit a couple of sort of subsections um, and uh, so let's just get to it shall we Jim? okay so <sighs> politics is sort of a, a big subject and I don't think you can uh, necessarily capture it all with um, with, with one discussion, but um, I want to talk a little bit briefly about uh, my experience with politics. I've, I am a little left-leaning, as I mentioned, um, but I have, uh, I've run for office uh, three times. Or I'm in the midst of running for my third time now, this time for school board, uh, but I've run for state representative uh, years ago. And what else? Uh, and also school board years ago. Okay. So I'm 0 for 2 so far. Uh, we'll find out next week if I'm 0 for 3 or 1 for 3, but um, uh, either way, I've learned a lot about politics and learned a lot about how this works. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it can be sort of an ugly, uh, an ugly uh, thing to do, I mean, on both sides. I don't care if you're Democrat or mm -hmm. Republican. Yeah, there's a seedy underbelly to politics that everybody sort of knows is there. Um, and I was so disappointed the first time I ran. When I ran for state representative, I was Democrat on the ticket. And I still felt um, it's just dirty, you know, when you go and you meet with these groups, unions or, um, you know, special interest groups, political action committees, uh, and they endorse you, uh, you know, it was me against a Republican. So many of these things you go into, you talk to the pro-choice people, for example, I know they're going to endorse me because I'm the only Democrat on the ticket. And the Democratic Party apparatus endorsed you as well? Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the Democrats endorsed me, and um, so you go to some of these groups, teachers, unions, and things like that, where you sort of know ahead of time, okay, these people are going to endorse me. I'm the Democrat, unless I do something really egregious here. Um, they're going to endorse me, and then they'll give you money. Um, and that's where it starts to feel weird for me, you know, that, uh, okay, teachers union gave me $4,000, you know, that now, so what, do I owe, owe them something now? What Do the teachers unions care about kids or do they care about the teachers union and passing legislation their, that's going to support them? Their benefits and... Yeah, I mean, it's, and I think teachers um, do believe in the, in the right things, but, um, you know, it, uh, there's a conflict of interest there in, inherently with any group you talk to. And uh, it sounds super cheesy. Isn't that the nature of politics? You have to 
appeal to the the broadest section of people and compromises involved in that there is um, but you know getting special interests and getting money out of politics is uh, you know something that people are always talking about and and it sounds super cheesy but the the endorsement that you need to win is the people okay that's what the vote is for people vote unions don't vote um, you know the people within the unions vote and it's good to have endorsements there and and the question is you know geez I want to run for office I want to make a difference I want to change something mm -hmm. I don't want to go into the establishment here and um, kiss babies and do all that stuff and I don't want to owe unions anything but if I don't do that how am I gonna win right. and if I don't win I can't get in there to affect if any you change don't at get all. money because it costs money to win right? you want to send out a mailer to 30,000 people mm -hmm. you know you know and um, you know, it's going to cost thousands you. of dollars just to run for state representative. Oh, yeah, absolutely. There's, you know, there's eighty thousand people in Hillsboro. You know, if I want to send each of them a mailer, conservatively, fifty, sixty cents a piece. You know, times so that's thirty thousand dollars right there for to send out mm -hmm. a, the postcard that you and I throw away. Right. Um, so I, you know, it's uh, I guess the message I'm trying to uh, send out here is that I've been involved in politics. Um, and um, you know it's uh, it's an ugly game one way or the other, and um, you know I don't think I don't think politicians are are inherently bad people. I think at the national level, I mean, you you kind of have to be a I don't know a little bit of a sociopath to well I mean you you have to appear to be empathetic with a broad range of people and their issues yes you have, you have um, to that be sort you of might robotic. not really care about or mm -hmm. or and if you're really self-serving you know if you're a sociopath you can make it appear that you really care when really you don't mm -hmm. well and so there's sort of a chicken and egg question built in there which is do these people start off sociopaths or you know, I think lots of people go into politics and say, man, I'm going to really, I'm going to shake up the system and I'm going to really create change. And how many actually do that? They get there, they're there for 10, 20, 30 years, and um, you get comfortable and you get lots of, uh, you know, you're in lots of people's pockets. And I don't know if that turns you into something that you weren't already to begin with, um, but I think the people that should be running for office and should be in office are not the ones who can get elected these days, unfortunately. Do you think that the national national politicians at the national level in Washington, D.C., is, is that just a bigger piece of what you did as running for state representative? It's just bigger, and is it essentially the same thing? Yeah, I, th I, I would guess it's a matter of scale. I mean, I think either way, there's a million special interests in Oregon, you know, that are concerned about local special interests, and you just... If you're running for Congress or something like that, um, it's times a thousand. I mean, the, the quantities of money you're talking about. Um, so I think it is the, the same. I mean, school board is a little bit of a different deal. It's it's supposed to be a nonpartisan position. Mm -hmm. It's um, so it's a little bit unique, and you like to think that everybody who's running for school board cares about education and kids, and that's why they're there. But the reality is that lots of people use uh, running for school board as a, a stepping stone into politics. Well, yeah, I don't think you'd jump right into running for senator of Oregon. You... No. I mean, I, t I jumped into state representative because I didn't know. I was too young to know better. You okay. Know? I mean, I was 23 and raring to go. Right. And I was, and even then, I was really, I was running on a platform of education because that was the year that um, we had the shortest school year in the nation in Hillsboro. And, I, and uh, my oldest son was starting kindergarten that year, and I said, this is crazy. Why is nobody doing something about this? So they didn't have a Democratic candidate. I ended up on the ticket, and um, the rest was history. But, um, yeah, I, I think usually you would start with something smaller like a school board or a, or a councilman or something like that, and, and then you sort of work your way up. Um, so I, in talking about politics, we want to hit a couple of specific issues here. Um, and one of them that we want to talk about that's always fun is gun control. Um, I know there's lots of different thoughts uh, out there on Use this. both hands. Use, yeah, absolutely. You want to be sure, you know, um, sure what you're shooting at. Um, but, 
you know, it's a it's a contentious issue. Uh, I definitely come from a left leaning side of this in that I do not shoot guns. I don't own guns. You never have, right? Have you ever shot? Oh, one time. I have. Shot I've shot gun. guns. I mean, I'm from Indiana originally, so that's you know, like deer hunting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, people have that's shot guns. That's a very guns. red state. Right? Yeah, I've, yeah, I've shot you know clay pigeons and things. I've never hunted an animal. Um, but, you know, we can't seem to come to a consensus. Have you ever run country. over an animal with your car? Accidentally. On purpose? No, oh, okay. no, not on purpose. Not on purpose. Um, but, you know, we can't seem to come to a consensus in this country about gun control. And this is something that even some of my liberal or lefty friends are gun owners and feel really strongly on this one issue. Um, and I don't know how we come to terms with this. I've got some facts about gun control here that I just thought Let's hear them. we could sort of go through. Um, if you've got some thoughts on gun control, you want to weigh in on this, again, give us a call, 503-207-7135. Give us a call, and we'll mic in the booth there. I'll get your name and put you through. Uh, so we, we had this bill, right, this um, Toomey Mansion, I think is how you pronounce their names, these two senators who put together this bill. Um, that was super watered down, really. Um, no, no bans. I mean, initially they were talking about assault weapons. Let's ban assault weapons. Mm -hmm. um, clips that hold, you know, more than 30 rounds or whatever. There's a whole bunch of stuff on the table. All that got wiped away because the NRA Background and everybody checks. came in and just, uh -huh. you know, there's, there's no way. We're not, this is not even going to be discussed. So they got it super watered down and said, all right, background checks. Who doesn't agree with that? Right. I mean, we we can all agree with. Yeah, that. I think the consensus was seventy to ninety percent of the general population said that background checks right. for gun buyers, they were in favor of that. That's right. And every every poll that's been taken since then and everything um, shows just uh, tremendous support for that kind of thing. You have to have a license to drive a car. Right. Um, I mean. It doesn't seem like a crazy request. It doesn't seem like a crazy idea. I'm no. So, um, so under current law, if you're a federally licensed gun dealer, you have to do background checks for people. If you are selling at a gun show and you're not federally licensed, you don't need to do that. And uh, from what I understand, online gun sales you can just do not do background checks, which it seems crazy to me. You could go to eBay and buy it. I mean, I don't right. know. Again, I don't buy guns, so I don't. Uh, I don't claim to have a whole bunch of knowledge on that subject, but um, the only people who have to do background checks are federally licensed gun dealers. So, um, what is the fear? I mean, why are people? Well, there's there's two things that you get when you talk to gun rights advocates. Um, number one, the notion of a registry scares them. If you start registering my handguns, that you're going to come take them away and. This is the first sign in society of, of you coming to, you know, this is something the Nazis would do, is they, first they make a list and then they, uh, which, uh, folks, if you're out there, that's a crazy paranoid argument. So stop making it because um, it doesn't speak well for you or your, or your supporters. Uh, I mean, it's just silly to feel that way in today's world. Um, now, let me, let me throw the, the, the Democrats under the bus here for a minute, because uh, I do have a bone to pick with them about this statistic that they've been touting, and I touted it too because I thought it was true. Um, and um, they, the statistic has been going around that 40% of guns are purchased without a background check. Um, and so you think, well, geez, all right, we've got to get a background check in place for these 40%. That's a crazy amount of guns. Of course we need background checks. Here's the way it turns out. In 1994, okay, so this is 20 years ago, there was a survey of 250 gun owners, all right? And they were asked if the guns that they owned, if they thought that they came from a federally licensed dealer or not, okay? And of those 250 people, 64% said that, oh, yeah, I think I got my gun from a federally licensed person. The remaining 36% said, I don't know, okay? So what happened is they took that 34%, they rounded up to 40%, and they said 40% of guns today are sold without background checks. So it's based on a 20-year-old number from a survey taken of 250 gun owners, mm -hmm. which is a tiny sample. I mean, that doesn't tell us anything. And so liberals, you're doing, oh, we got dial tone on the air there. Uh, gun owners, you're, uh, excuse me, 
liberals, you're doing yourselves a disservice uh, when you tout this number that you give the gun lobby a reason to just pick that apart and say that's crap. Because it is. That's not a... Uh, let's let's find out what the real number is. How many guns are in reality being sold with background without background checks? Because gun owners will tell you, um, it's not as many as you think. Oh no, everybody has to. Even at gun shows, that's a fallacy that they're selling them without them. I would like to know the real number. I'd love at to see a gun a study. show. You have to have a background check. If you're a federally licensed gun dealer. Yeah. So then the question is, well, how? What about Joe Schmo who goes in there who's got 40 guns to sell? He's not a federal licensed dealer. He just buys a booth, sets up shop. He doesn't need to he do that. He has a bunch of guns, and he sells them yeah. to whoever walks in. No, 200 bucks. Here you go, buddy. Yeah. Now, so the question is, we got dial tone again. I think we have to hear something about your computers plugged into the system, your laptop in there. Oh, we're having some technical difficulties. Weird phone issues. We have a call in, so we're, we need to call her back. OK. Well, whoever called in, we're working on calling you back. Uh, Having some technical issues, we'll let the boys in the booth deal with that. Uh, the only thing that my audio is plugged into in there is the headphone out, so that should not affect the phones, hopefully. Um, so, so let's talk about why there's no data on that, Jim. You got, you're using a survey, not you. People are using a survey from 20 years ago with 250 people. and here's There's a, just so much Im misinformation um, about it. Um, here's an interesting thing I found out. In 1994, about the same year they did that survey, yeah. the NRA lobbied Congress to pass an amendment that discouraged gun research. Well, the the NRA, in its you know in the We've 50s, got Arlette on the air. Oh, Arlette, Arlette, okay. come on in. I know Arlette. Hey, Arlette. Oh, you're delayed, huh? Uh, yeah, you're gonna have to turn down your uh, your feed there. There's about a five or six second delay, so turn off your your internet stream. So what's what's going on, Arlette? I'm just waiting to ask my question. What do you got? But I all get to say it on the air? No, you're on the air right now. Oh, okay, great. Well, here's my question. So you ran for office a long time ago. I did. And now you're running for office again. I am. And the tools available to us to broadcast who you are are very different today than they were back then. True. So you feel like you have... Oh, we got a little feedback there. You still there, Arlette? I'm still here. Okay. Uh, do I feel like what? Do you feel like you have more tools in your, uh, you know, available to you to get your message out? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I, um, I certainly, when I ran, started this race, um, felt like I did. I mean, I felt like, okay, well, now it's when I ran before, there was no Facebook. You know, there, there was no um, Twitter <laughs> or any of that stuff. Um, yeah, we're getting weird feedback in here, McKenzie. <laughs> I'm not sure why. Um, but, um, yeah, so I thought, well, geez, this time, everybody I know online, I just hit a button, and they're going to be able to vote for me and, um, you know, tell their friends to vote for me and all that. Um, so I felt like that would be an edge. Uh, the reality of that is um, that it's become so commonplace online, you know, posting things about, you know, a cute picture of your cat to this or that, that nobody really cares about politics online. I mean, um, so I don't know that you're going to win an election with Facebook. It certainly makes it easier to stay in touch if you have a website and you have emails and you um, can, uh, you know, have a feed that keeps people up to date. But um, it's not the game changer that I thought it would be, honestly. Uh, you know, now one one piece of technology that's interesting, Arlette, that it was the same in 2004. I mean, I'm sure it's improved, but um, the voter databases um, that people have, and it's much more advanced now, but they had it in 2004 when I ran, and I found that interesting as a candidate. Um, you can, you know, if you're just going to walk door to door, you're not going to make that much headway because there's 80,000 doors in your district, and only 20,000 of them are registered to vote. You know, and of those 20,000, uh, 7,000 are Democrats, um, you know, 3,000 are independents, and it breaks down smaller and smaller. And so you need to really maximize your efficiency when you're doing this. And um, they've got some incredible tools out there that the parties use. The Democratic Party has one, the Republican Party has one, where they've got this database of whether you're registered. Now, it doesn't tell you how people have voted, of course, because that's secret, but it tells you that they have voted. Um, 
and it tells you if they're registered as a Republican or registered Democrat or registered Independent. And so they've got these sort of web-based tools now where you can go online and slice it and dice it uh, and say, okay, I want a map for this, dist for this section of town. Show me only the people who are registered Democrats and voted in the last two school board elections. And it prints you out this cool thing that you give out to your supporters and they take it and they go door to door. It can print out phone lists for you. And I continue to be amazed by that technology and how, I mean, I'm sure 10 years ago or 12 years ago, it was not anything close to what it was today. And I'm sure 15 years ago, it didn't exist. Um, so it seems like that's the biggest weapon in campaigns arsenals now is this huge database and it goes right up to the last minute. You know, our, the election is next week here in Oregon and every day that database gets updated between now and then and they'll see, did Arlette vote? Did she, has she not voted? And so if you have not voted and you've not submitted your ballot, you're going to get hit hard in that last week by people knocking on your door and trying to sway you one way or another because they can see from their computer, oh, she hasn't voted yet, we better go visit her while we still have a chance. So, um, and are those tools only available if you're an independent? And I mean, if you're a party endorsed candidate, if you ran as independent, would you still have access to that? Yes. Uh, well, no. Um, I got it through the Democratic Party um, because I'm a registered. Now, the school board is a nonpartisan position, and that's what I'm running for now. But I am a registered Democrat. Um, and so you can go to your, uh, your party headquarters and apply for that. Um, it's, it's technically public record, you know, people who have voted and all that, it's the Secretary of State's office. What they're doing is scraping that and, you know, transforming it. Uh, I mean, and you and I are both IT people, Arlette, so you, you know how, you know, data warehousing works and, and all that sort of stuff. I mean, that's, they're, they're taking this data and making it visually appealing and easy to slice and dice and sort. So the original data is public record, but um, the only way you're going to get access to it with one of these high-tech programs is if you are part of a party. And I think the National Democratic Party builds the system, and then you know the Democratic Party of Oregon sort of leases out a portion of it from them, and, and so on and so forth, down to the county level. So if you're if you're an independent, I don't know how you would um, how you'd get a hold of that, and I you know that's. That brings us to, you know, the two-party system. It's like there's an opportunity for a business now. There is. There certainly is. Yeah, I mean, if somebody built, uh, you know, an app, you just build the same app that these guys have. Um, and, I mean, gosh, if, some, if somebody was to build that and make it freely available to anybody, I mean, that would be tremendous help to people who wanted to make a political difference, um, you know, who are not tied to a specific party. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts on that, Arlette? Yeah, I mean, actually, I did that sort of work a long time ago, more than, uh, let's see, probably 20 years ago, we uh, did some database work when I was working for a candidate who was running for the state legislature. And this group slowly built up the database to have information about <clears throat> more than just whether they voted or not. Um, but they kind of um, profiled them and did door knocking and kept that information and had it build over time. So uh, I think that you know, you can build a little fiefdom if you kind of work together in a neighborhood situation and collect that information and build on it over time. Yeah, definitely. And they do, um, I mean, it is a little eerie how much information is in that database. I mean, they've got, uh, they do have, because they do phone calls, you know, the, the uh, Obama campaign folks will do phone calls and they'll make notes in the database that, you know, this person is really friendly. Um, towards liberals, this person, um, uh, you know, they'll make certain notes about this person's married or recently widowed or this person cares about schools and they sort of mark it off on this template. And um, so, yeah, there is, I'm not sure what the business model is behind that. I mean, certainly the parties themselves have tons of money they can throw at it. Uh, and this is how they're going to make more money is by getting themselves reelected. So uh, it's definitely in their best interest to keep that database up. Um, but I don't know. I don't know what resource there really is for Joe Schmo out there to to get at that. Yeah. Yeah. I. Um, so did that answer your question, Arlette, yeah, in terms yeah, of technology? Yeah. Up and uh, listen to the rest of your show. Yeah. Okay. All well, right. Thanks, th thanks for calling, Arlette. All right. All right. Um. So yeah, that was a good question from Arlette. I you know, I when I started this thing again, Jim, it I, I felt like technology would be helpful. Uh, and would be much different than the last time I ran in 2005. 
Um, but yeah. it was very similar? Well, it, I mean, the technology has changed, um, but, um, you know, we feel like that makes the world a smaller place, but I'm not sure that that translates to politics, I guess, is, is, is my end message there. Um, let, me, let me go back to gun control for a second here. Um, so the NRA in 1994 lobbied folks and got this thing passed that said, um, you know, there, uh, there cannot be any, um, you can't use federal money or state money for research that can advocate or promote gun control. Right. The, the NRA became a lobby for the gun industry right. after a certain point. In the 50s and 60s, they pushed hunter safety and safety mm -hmm. with firearms, and it was, uh, you know, pretty apolitical. Uh, you know, people had guns, uh, whatever, and then th they became the lobby for the gun industry. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, that's a shame. Yeah. I mean, and... and what they did in this recent term here in, in getting this bill defeated um, is despicable. Yeah, they've done everything. So they saw what happened to the tobacco industry with cigarettes, mm -hmm. and they did the gun industry did not want that to happen to themselves. So they, um, you know, had legislation, uh, lobbied for legislation, just like you said there, yeah. Um, Isn't there a stat, guys, that says that gun shootings in America has been cut in half since like 1970 or something like just the media we get more media coverage so we think there's more crime but there's really not I think there's about 30,000 people a year that are killed in the United States with firearms that's a, a ballpark figure um, it, comparing that to like Japan or where it's uh, several hundred um, I thought it was 10,000 no Still more like 30,000 yeah uh, I, I, I don't know the stat you're talking about, Mike, and I would find it very hard to believe that uh, there's been that much of a reduction from the 70s. I just I find that hard to believe. Um, but you know, the NRA made it so it's impossible for us to find out what the numbers are on a lot right. of this stuff. And I just I didn't know that until I started researching this yesterday. And I was like, ah. Well, you just have to pick up the paper, any newspaper, any day, and there's gun violence in the newspaper <sighs> or on the news. And that's anecdotal. Yeah. But what I want to... We have uh, Dylan on the end. Oh, all right. Uh, Dylan, right, are Dylan. you there? Yep. Oh, there he is. What do you What do you got for us? Well, um, since you guys are talking about gun control, I thought that I would like to pitch in a little. So, I don't completely understand why people are kind of rooting for gun control. Nope, yeah. Oh. Sorry, go ahead. A little sound there. But, Sorry. um... Anyway, I don't understand why people are rooting for the gun control laws when you tell me more about how criminals always obey the laws, but I don't really think that it's going to change anything to make sure that everybody kind of gets restraints from firearms. Okay, so, th so there's a particular graphic going around the internet. Uh, and I, I know in this case, specifically that Dylan has seen it and that people have seen it, and it's a humorous graphic. Um, and it sort of makes this straw man argument that, uh, you know, well, criminals don't listen to the law anyway, so making laws about this isn't going to help. Um, that is partially true. Uh, that's assuming that criminals are the only ones that use guns, which is not the case. Um, I mean, there are tons of cases of... Um, you know, road rage where people, you know, have a gun handy to them and they lose their temper in the moment and, you know, all of a sudden they can't take something back. Um, yeah. You know, or, or um, I mean, there's lots of different cases like that where a gun a is not necessary. A guy in China recently that had a pickaxe and he went berserk and I think he picked four people with his pickaxe, but if he had had an AK-47, That's you know, the way they do things over yeah. there. No, but so here's the problem. So here's the argument they make. They say, people say, listen, crimes are not being committed by, um, by law-abiding citizens with these things, so why can't I have a 30-round uh, magazine and a sniper rifle and a 50 caliber gun in my backyard? Here's why. You don't need that crap. Um, uh, I don't care about your right to have it just because you think you have a right to have it for no other reason. Um, if we make these laws and we make these guns harder to get, 
then there will be fewer guns to go around. It's a supply and demand thing. Um, I'm not necessarily saying uh, that, you know, that this is going to fix everything, um, but if you reduce the number of guns, um, uh, you know, that are going out there to folks, um, then there's less guns to have, whether whether you have it legally or illegally. Um, you know, I don't. Uh, it doesn't matter to me. Um, there will just be fewer guns to go around. So that's why you put these laws in place. And you know, if if the only people buying guns are law-abiding citizens, then they should have no problem submitting to a background check. You know, you're sort of answering your own question there. Um, you know, so it. I mean, that's just something, that's just a false, it, it's a false argument, I guess. Jim, what are your thoughts on that? I just, you know, I, I mean, ideally, there should be a background check on everyone that wants to buy a gun um, when the police get guns that are illegal, they melt them down. Right. Um, they slowly decrease the, uh, you know, People should be able to have a shotgun, a hunting rifle if they want, I guess a pistol. I don't see any need to have a magazine with more than, what, 10 rounds in it. Well, that's the argument um, I make, yeah. You know, a back, just to see if you're, if you're, you know, have any record of mental instability or, you know, the recent shootings, um, several of them could have been prevented. The, the kid at... Uh, Virginia Tech that killed 30 some people or whatever. Crazy. Um, he had a history of mental illness. Mm -hmm. That would have been prevented. Um, the guy in Arizona, he had a history of mental illness. Um, both of them would have been prevented from buying guns. The uh, kid that killed the, the little kids in Connecticut, um, I'm not sure if he had, if there was history of mental illness with him as well. I don't. Uh, you know, and, and he took his mother's gun and killed his mother. You know, you're not going to stop at all, but, you know, people steal cars and you still need to have cars licensed and you need to have a driver's license. And, uh, yes, I think that um, just like the in the auto industry, they were forced to put seat belts in and, and airbags and slowly... Um, safety and they fought tooth and nail the car industries because it eats into their profit I think that weapons manufacturers need to be held accountable for their um, the uh, deadly items that they create and you know there are lots of things you could do you could have trigger locks you can have um, you know a chip in the gun so only the owner of the gun can fire it there are lots of, of ways that they can make guns safer. Um, again, because of the lobbying of the gun crazy, um, you know, I mean, the House of Representatives, let's face it, is controlled by people that are still fighting the Civil War. Um, well, well, and here's, uh, so let's talk about... Really? <laughs> what, muskets? You don't believe that they're muskets? Mitch McConnell, what was I well, oh. <laughs> is that unable to be argued, Jim? Oh, I, I don't know. Uh, you know, I mean, let me let me address specifically the NRA. I, in, I don't want any laws for my guns. In, in regards to this, I want to have a machine gun. <laughs> well, people want to. I mean, that's the first problem you have when you're talking with gun supporters is. A refusal to admit that there should be any line whatsoever. Can I have right. a bazooka? Can I have? I mean, what's a missile right. launcher? What do I? Where, where's the line? Can I just drive a tank to work? What? And um, I think I think many of them will say, "Well, yeah, that's that's my right." And um, no, you don't get to cling to something that was written 200 years ago and and just uh, you know pretend that that gives you license to do whatever you want because it mm -hmm. doesn't. But back to this bill. This was so watered down and only talked about background checks and said, we're going to get these background checks done. Now, so here's what the NRA did to kill this thing. They played on all these different fears, okay, and they said, so the Gun Owners of America, which is not the NRA, a different group, but they said in regard to this ban, if, you're, if your private gun transaction is covered by Toomey Mansion, and virtually all will be, 
you can assume that you will be part of a national gun registry. Okay? That's absolutely patently false. Just a flat-out lie. The, the bill itself had specific language in it that said it's illegal to create a registry. Right. Okay? Right. That law already exists. It had safeguards. It's already illegal to create a registry. This bill took it even further and added several steps to say there will not be a registry. Did not stop the gun groups from saying, oh, this is going to be a registry. The NRA said that the bill would have, quote, criminalized certain private transfers of firearms between honest citizens requiring lifelong friends, neighbors, and some family members to get government approval. The bill specifically said there's no background check for siblings, spouses, aunts, uncles, nieces, cousins, grandparents. So you could you could will your Absolutely. You could you could give AK a gun or sell a gun to your uh, Absolutely. to your 5-year-old. What was it the the 5-year-old shot the 2-year-old in uh, allegedly uh, in uh, and and there and they they actually make guns that are smaller yes. to the scale of a child. And they're then, cricket guns, cricket. and they're they're there are pink ones marketed towards little girls. And um, I did not realize that till that story came out, and I find that obscene. But um, it's it's bizarre. It's it's just America. I mean, I it's bizarre. Um, I I what I don't understand is just I, it's one thing to sort of. Um, spin the truth a little bit your way, but to just flat out well, lie. Okay, think about it. I mean, a hundred years ago, 50 years ago, it's Kentucky. Um, you know, you're in a rural location. You you eat some of the food that you go out and hunt and kill yourself. No problem. And, you know, you're six or seven years old, and your your dad says, you know, this is, you know, a 22, and you can get squirrels with it. This is how it works. You know, um, there's some cans here. I'm going to stand behind you, you know, and so I, I guess I could see that happening. But when then when you get the profit motive and the corporation involved, and they, you know, how can we, you know, make more profit? Well, let's have pink guns and let's market them to children, and we'll, you know, we'll have Joe Camel with a, you know, with his pink gun. And we'll market it to the children, and you know that's a different thing altogether. Um, yeah, I mean, it's one thing I understand wanting your kids to be comfortable around guns. Five is ridiculous, ridiculous. You don't let them have sharp scissors when they're five in school. You know, they have I, the rounded. I don't want my gun rack. <laughs> That's I don't Jim's. Want nobody messing with my gun rack. For those of you at home, that's Jim's. Uh, is that Mitch McConnell? Is that your no, Mitch McConnell impression? Or, uh, or is that just a generic uh, Kentucky? See, impression? I mean, this it shows you again that in the national politics in Washington D.C., they call it in the Beltway. They're totally out of touch with American and uh, the problems that we have, and they spend their time, you know, fighting each other. Instead of solving the problems uh, that, that that we face, I well, here's the deal. Here's the bottom line. Okay, and we'll move on up from gun control to some other things here in, in the in the last few minutes that we've got here. Um, this was a watered down bill that basically addressed the concerns that I think most people in America had: background checks. Yeah. And and it also called for a commission to study the cause of violence. You know, it had mental health provisions in it. Right. It, it was a really tame bill. And the people who voted against it, which includes some Democrats in, in red states. Again, worried about their reelection. They're getting reelected. Their job, yeah. And they voted against it because they're from Alaska or, you know, um, someplace like that. Uh, that uh, they should be ashamed of themselves. This was absolutely a common sense bill. There is zero reason that it should have failed, and um, we should all be disgusted with that. Um, and you know, it's just absolutely sad. I hope it comes back. I hope something similar to it comes the, back, and we can get it done. The people have to lead. The people have to stand up and lead. I don't because, think that's going to happen. Well, because well, when things get bad enough, the people do stand up. But um, you know, the politician is a follower. And he, you know, puts his finger to the wind, and if he feels that, you know, 51% of the people are going to, you know, are this, then he's, 
you know, going to protect his job and his re-election, I guess. I well, all right. So perfect segue into my next topic, okay, which I want to talk about, and that's term limits. Um, I, 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 there are so many things wrong with politics these days. Uh, just Term limits? You mean those birds, the terns? No, no, no. Term, we're talking oh, about term, term limits. limits. Term limits. Um, and I don't care if you're a Republican, you're a Democrat, you're an independent, uh, you're a libertarian, you're an anything. You should be for term limits, and I'm going to tell you why. And if you disagree with me, then you're wrong. And I'll tell here's you. Here's why you're wrong. And here's why you're wrong. That's right. Um, you see the way I effortlessly weaved the yes, name of the show uh -huh. in there? Um, I have to give you kudos. You, I mean, the graphics that Mick has done and the work that he's gone into this, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Very nothing, nicely nothing done. but the best. Top down. Very yeah. nicely done. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Um, term limits. So, okay, when the framers of our Constitution and the fathers of our country and yada yada yada, when yeah. all those people created things back then, they were farmers. They were blacksmiths. They were other things. They were not. Well, they were they were propertyed landowners, and they were wealthy white men. Yeah. Yes, yes, they were wealthy white men, but... Yeah. Um, and they owned slaves, and, uh, yeah. Yeah, you're crapping on my point here, Jim. Okay. <laughs> uh, my, my point is that I don't think they envisioned um, politi career politicians. I don't think George Washington was... I mean, he was in sort of the right place, right time, I suppose, but... Um, they wanted him to be king. I know. I know, and uh, you know, I'm glad he didn't take it. But uh, I guess what I'm getting at is that I think that um, it is supposed to be a citizen legislature. You know, okay. if you look at if you look at the jobs that these people have, and I should put huge quotes around jobs because I don't know how they can have a job and be there for 30 years. They don't. Uh, but um, the vast majority of them are lawyers. Vast majority. Mm -hmm. This is what this is. Who's running the country? Lawyers. Uh, we all know how exactly how popular lawyers are in popular culture. Everybody loves a lawyer. Am I right? Um, no, they don't. I'm kidding. Uh, people don't like lawyers. Um, and they're right there with used car salesmen. Lawyers and used car salesmen are, you know, drug addicts. And they're about the same. There, realtors are, are coming no, close. No offense to to used car salesmen. Yeah. <laughs> Or drug addicts, really. Yeah. Um, right. But, uh, you know, this is who's running the country. And once you get in there, we have a, we have term limits on presidents. You get two terms and you're Two terms. Um, and that's about it. And um, so it, it turns out that in the 90s, uh, and this was sort of before my time or when I was too young to really know anything about it, um, 24 states put congressional term limits on their ballot. And the public overwhelmingly supported it two to one. Mm -hmm. Yes, we want limits on all these things. And then in 1995, a Supreme Court ruling said that states can't do that. They can't impose term limits on their federally elected so uh, representatives. So ruled by decree from the Supreme Court. Huh? Basically. Um, and so since then, uh, polls well, show... How can they put a term limit on the president then? Uh, I think that's in a constitutional is amendment. Is that a constitutional I think, amendment? I okay. think it is. So it would have it would take a constitutional amendment then. Yes. Uh, and that takes a two thirds vote. Right. And ratification by uh, three quarters of the states. To to, to pass something okay. like that. Um, but polls show that Americans support term limits, um, seventy five percent. Well, I mean, on the other side. It, it is a very complex thing running the government, don't you think? And I, so yeah, if and so the argument a, is that you're going to get a new person in there right, and they want to have the experience. And they have to learn the same thing over again. So that is a point. That is a valid point. Uh, it's semi-valid. Here's why you're wrong, Jim. Okay. Uh, you know, let's say you've got a four-year term in the Senate, okay? I'm not saying it needs to be one four-year term. Give them two. Six. Isn't it six years in the Senate? Uh, yeah, not maybe. I'm just making up numbers. Oh, okay. Here. I'm, I'm saying let's imagine. So give for a them two four-year terms. Give them. Let's give people at least eight years in office. Okay, I'm fine with and eight then maybe, years. Maybe have an election and a year before that senator leaves, the new one comes before in. Before that, you can learn. No, before that, four years before. Oh, okay. You alternate them. 
Okay. Oh, all right. So you're going to have a senior senator and you're going to have a junior senator. Okay. And the junior senator is going to have four years okay. with the senior around to learn from them. Right. And, blah, 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 and then it goes like that. Okay. Um, I, do you think that these people sit down at their computer and write the bills? I think they don't. I think more importantly is the money in politics. That's has, the thing. Has corrupted the system. So, yeah. The only way to eliminate that. And, okay. Because, because they are spending the entire time running for re-election right. for 30 years. Right. With the lobbyists and even with the American people. Yeah. Um, I want a lame duck. I want someone to go in there and know that they're not going to get reelected. Somebody put their gum on this chair. Oh, interesting. Nice. It's probably a previous show. Must a have been. It was show. not us. It wasn't me. Okay. Cytology. Um, so the, um, but the. Is that from science class? I, what grade? is cytology? Is that? Cytology. Oh, psychology. Psy. See what? I'm sorry. Go ahead, Nick. <laughs> I keep you on track, Jim. So don't encourage him, Mike. For God's sake. I'm doing everything I can in here. Don't wave shiny things in front of him, Jim. Oh, gross. Okay. Okay. Anyways, uh, yeah, it's absolutely about running for re-election, winning over and over again. I want someone to go in there and say, I've got two terms. Right. I'm going to do what's right. I don't care if you re-elect me. I'm not going to be here for 30 years right. doing nothing but uh, being a politician and then retiring and getting paid by these lobbies and making speeches and retiring on that. That's it'd, not what it's about. And it would be interesting to see how long through the history of the country representatives and senators were in office. It's and getting and longer and longer, longer. I'll tell you that longer. right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be an interesting thing to know. Yeah, it... Um, well, but so you've got this sort of problem that's built into this, which is how do you get the people who you want to limit to vote to limit themselves? Right. Uh, it's like I don't voting have an to, to give yourself a pay cut. Right. Yeah. Um, you're going to need two-thirds of a majority in both houses to be selfless enough to do that. Right. And... Um, you know, can that ever happen? I don't know. I like to think that it can at some point. I, I, it's pretty difficult to imagine, well, frankly. Where do you see it heading then? I mean, where do you see the country heading? Well, you talk about people needing to rise up. Um, you know, and, and let me talk about my races, my political races. And one of the biggest things that I learned is um, how lethargic people are. And people just don't care. They just don't want to get involved. Yeah, but there will be a moment where there will be a revolution. Well, well when people keep saying when, that when they Eventually. when they Eventually. lose their television when and they the lose their cars, yeah, right, like the Great right. Depression. When the middle class is no more and we're all uh, serfs, you know. Well, when is that going? That's not going to happen. How do you know? Right now, four hundred. You can't print your way into prosperity. No, that's never happened before. No, of course I, not. I, this is what I've heard. Right now, four hundred families own more wealth than the bottom fifty million people in the country. That. I that think that's probably right. true. That is not right. I think that's probably true. Yeah. But I still think that the vast majority of those 50 million people have internet. They have TV. They have microwaves. Right. And they what are I'm comfortable. Saying, when those go away and you're, you have to look at each other and go, dude, I can't zone out on the cable because I don't have it anymore. Um, I, my car, I can't put gas in it. Um, well... Here's you know, the, the roads have potholes because no one will pay taxes anymore. The, 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 this is what I heard today. So I guess I'm, go, you're going, I'm going off the term limit thing, but it was corporate taxes have decreased by half in the last, is it 30 years? I can believe that. Personal income taxes on the first $113,000 uh, that, that we make, which most people, I, I don't make up more than 113000 those taxes have doubled, okay, in the last 30 years. Um, corporate profits are through the roof, okay? So a few people are doing phenomenally well while the rest of us are stagnating our, our wages. Um, At a certain point, whose fault is that, though? Yes, the greedy are going to be greedy, and I can't make them not greedy anymore. But if you uh, don't want to get involved and you don't try to stop this, 
Right. So people need to be involved. Um, you know, part of the goal of a portion of the government uh, of politicians is to keep people separated and not united and, and disjointed and confused and uh, distracted with uh, sports, you know. Uh, or saying that they're going to do something and then doing the exact opposite, but everyone believes them because they're so good at saying it over and over and over. Right, every, every, yeah. I don't think people even believe them, though. I don't think anybody believes them. I think people just don't care. I don't, I don't agree with that. I mean, look at how many people, I mean, not to talk about specifics, but how many people went to Obama's first election or even his second inauguration. I mean, we believe, we want to believe. Americans want to believe. Right. Um, I suppose, but if you went into that first election thinking that this guy was going to walk on water and, and change the way everything worked, you're crazy. No, he's, I have he, family members that still think he's phenomenal. I think he's, he's phenomenal. I he's think he's kind doing a good of, job. Uh, he's kind of, uh, you know, he's Richard Nixon was to the left of Barack Obama. <laughs> he uh, has compromised. If he's phenomenal, then how come Jim's stats are probably right on track? Well, you're talking about 30 years. He can't Which go in there. Is he again? Yeah, he's, yeah, he's yeah. the president. He's a Democrat, but um, he has to contend with all the Republicans that will not pass a single thing that he tries to do. They've obstructed everything. They've filibustered. They've obstructed uh, their whole thing. I mean, there's a black man in the White House, and enough said. And they will do everything. And he, I, what I don't understand is he keeps trying to, like, work with the Republicans. Appease Dude, them, yeah. They... They will never work with you. They will. Exactly. They hate you. They will never work with you. They will do everything in their power to uh, derail and discredit your administration, and uh, you know, fight back. That's the thing with the Democrats. They do not fight back. You know, I, I, they tend to of, roll over and take it. Yeah, it's kind of a a, a big tent. Well, we way. rule by committee. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Republicans and 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 the right side want a leader, and they all fall in behind, without really thinking or or you know uh, that's how they get people to vote against their own best interest. I guess uh, is you know you anyway. So what do you think makes do you so think term that limits. we're going to have a revolution? Not in the Either way. No, not in the way that you think there will be one. Um, I mean, uh, there's not going to be like an Egyptian uh, revolution here where we're flipping cars in the streets and doing that sort of thing. It's just not going to happen. I think people will eventually get sick enough of this crap that uh, some third-party candidate who is just right and can get just enough support will come along and change things. Do you think we should have a parliamentary system where uh, there are, you know, the House of Representatives, how many seats are there? 400 and... And, and so, you know, you could have, I don't think we need 30 parties, but I think we need four or five. I would agree with that. You know, um, it, that's the other thing that both of the parties do is they prevent any kind of meaningful third party from occurring. Um, Guys, I, I mean, America is the place... I could totally see a revolution happening here once it gets really, really, really bad. Uh, here's Look at the L.A. riots. I mean, people got mad over a court case. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, w I wouldn't call that a revolution, but... I mean... Sure. Uh, here's, here's the problem. Here's the problem. Let me take a swing at the left here for a minute. Okay. Occupy Wall Street, Occupy Portland, Occupy whatever... Mm -hmm. um, are a bunch of super left hippies who need to shut up. Uh, I'm tired of your crap. You're not 99%. Um, and I'm so sick of that. Those are the people who think they're going to create a revolution. And there's 20 of them camping in a park downtown that they think they're going to make a difference. That's not how you make a difference, uh -huh. A. B, you have problems with our society. And I'll bet you if I looked at the taxes, if they filed taxes, of everybody in that group, 10% of them actually paid something into the pot, mm -hmm. and almost nobody else did. And they feel like they're entitled to something for free because, as you pointed out, God, all these wealthy people have all this other stuff. I, those wealthy people earned what they have. Well, that's what they my have nephew a right was saying. Right. 
That's fine. He they busted saying, their hump yeah. for that. You don't and get to just come in and say, these people have, you know, 1% of the people have all of the wealth. That's not the problem. If they got it um, in an illegal or an immoral way, then you can have a problem with that. But you can't be mad I don't at somebody know about for being illegal, rich. but definitely immoral when you take your, your uh, you offshore your money like uh, Mitt during the thing when he had the Swiss bank accounts or whatever. And they wouldn't even call him on that because pr they probably, you know, the Democrats, the, the high end Democrats probably have the same, you know, offshore accounts or whatever. But you can't be, uh, you can dislike Mitt and you cannot vote for him, but he did not break the law. He did not do no, anything right, wrong. I'm saying, what you need to do is work to change the law is, so he can't is, do that. What is immoral, what's immoral is if you have, you know, $50 billion. There's something called the commons where we're all part of the commons. We use the roads, the bridges, the fire, the police, the military. That all has to be paid for. Um, mm -hmm. If you're a corporation like Nike pays the state of Oregon only uh, taxes, if I understand it right, on what it sells in the state of Oregon, where they're a multi-billion dollar corporation around the world making a profit. Um, using the peaceful streets and infrastructure of the United States to produce that profit, they need to be paying more of a share in taxes than you and I do. And I don't mind paying my taxes. I really don't. And I'm honest about it. And, uh, you know, I want good roads. I want uh, health care. I want, um, you know, the police to, to be there when I call. Um, I agree with all those things, but okay. what you need to be careful about is feeling like uh, or putting out there that these people are rich and we should take their money from them. Because you can't live in that society. I don't want to live in that society. I don't have a right to just go say, you have more money than me, so give me yours. Now, come up with a, a – that's why the percentage is the great equalizer, okay? No matter how much money you make, if we all pay 30% into the kitty – or whatever. That's fair to me. That would be fairer than it is now and get I'm rid of all the that. loopholes. That would get rid of and get rid of all the loopholes and all the offshore accounts and all the, you know, it's it's one one in four corporations pay no taxes in know. this country. It's sick. Yeah, I agree. Okay. I agree. But we need to work to change the laws surrounding that and not um, well, who makes the laws? The legislature. The Congress, yeah. right? Yeah. Makes the laws. Absolutely. Who and, and how much does it cost to get elected? Oh. Uh, and who uh, pays the money for the politician to get elected? And who makes the laws? And who, if, if I pay you uh, a million dollars to get elected, I do, Jim, I pay uh, right. a million bucks. And because money is speech, According to the Supreme Court, I have more speech than you, and so you, the politician, listen to me uh, and make laws that I tell you I want made. Well, that's what we need to change. Okay. We've got to have a greed episode. This is great. A greed, well, we could have a whole, a whole episode about greed for sure. But, um, you know, I, I, the, the great equalizer, and we, we're going to wrap up here in just a minute, but if you have a million dollars or you have ten million dollars, you only still only have one vote, okay? And that's how we win this thing because you're, right. you're a company, you don't get a vote at all. Your president could vote for me once, right. but um, the people who have the power are the people of this country. And if they get involved and make change, then change will okay. happen. But they haven't been thus far. So how do we people need to wake up? How do we up. deal with the apathy? Uh, well, if and, I had the and, answer and, to that, and when when you know both spouse and the both spouses are working you know i'm know. working two jobs i hear you um, i hear you but if you want to change the world that's the only way to do it particularly this country at least is to get people more involved and uh, that means not complaining but going out there and doing something about it um we're gonna wrap up here folks uh i appreciate everybody listening in and watching hey. at home yeah, it was We're, great. Yeah, we had a good Very time. Good. And, uh, you know, look for our uh, next show. Check us out at wrongtvshow.com. Uh, and you can keep track of us there. So this is Mick and Jim saying have a good one.